Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Phoenix Gaming. We today are talking some great Western trail strategy. I've got to go to my old standby for a little bit uh, because I am pretty excited for the upcoming uh, World Series of Board Gaming, which is coming up in like four months at this point in September. Uh, in case you don't know, I started my channel in large part kind of commenting on those uh, games. If you are interested in getting in on this, you can certainly send me a message or go look it up. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but also, you can get a $40 discount if you use the Phoenix, Phoenix, the name of this channel, um, as, as a code on the website. Um, $40 off of uh, a stay and play for the, the four days or if you are just playing in all four games. So um, what I want to focus on what today's video is about is strategy and Great Western Trail, but not really strategy so much as what you should be considering based on the setup of the game. And we're going to be talking heavily about the buildings that are in the game and what that means for what's going to come up in the structure of that game. Great Western Trail is a game that I really love because it is a nice balance between strategy and tactics. If you take the strategy comments from this video and you walk into a game, you don't think tactically about what's going on, what I've told you here will be of absolutely no use to you. These are just a couple things at the beginning of the game for you to consider so that you can think about what um, is going to be kind of the way that this gameplay is going to flow out. And the very first thing that you consider uh, is actually not about the buildings. It is the breakdown or the ratio of bandits, or uh, if you're playing first edition, the, the Native Americans, um, to hazards. And so they're going to flip seven tiles at the beginning. And on the sample map that I've pulled here, uh, which is from a game that I, I played and screenshotted, um, you get, we had five hazards and two bandits. That's on the lower side, certainly, of the number of bandits that you can have, this is going to be a cash-poor game. The bottom row here has a huge amount of tax in the swamp, which means that players are incentivized to put taxers in that first row there because they're going to be starting the trail at the beginning and everyone's going to want to cash in on that. So you're going to be paying money along the way. It's easy to get past the desert. Might be a little bit more difficult at the end there. Well, that's not usually as important to me. It's the fact that there are a lot of hazards in that bottom row or sometimes in the desert. Those can be the most difficult places to get by because they're right at the beginning of your trip on your way to Kansas City. On top of that, the fewer bandits there are means the fewer cash flow there is in the game because second edition made it so that the you know, loan you take by going to Kansas City is not quite as valuable money-wise. Players need to find other ways to get cash, and one of the ways they did that was by improving essentially the quality of taking those bandits from the row. Um, however, there are only two in this game, so taking a bandit is not worth a ton of money. Uh, I didn't show the setup kind of in the top left of like what the upcoming tiles are. You can also take a look at those and see if there's piles of bandits up there. This might change pretty quickly um, or you might get a sense of what is upcoming in terms of maybe there are two sand hazards that are coming up. So you know that even the sand path is going to get in the way. That kind of thing can just tell you how important money flexibility is going to be um, throughout the course of this game. The other thing about it is that it's a it's a direct sliding scale. The more bandits there are, the fewer hazards there are, and vice versa. So you mostly get games with three bandits, four bandits, right? Something like that. But when you have zero, one, or two bandits, or five, six, or seven bandits, it's really going to change the... the I was going to say tapestry, but the, the kind of like flow over what the, the general beginning of the game looks like. So definitely consider bandits versus hazards just in terms of having a sense of like, am I going to need a lot of cash this game because there's a lot of hazards uh, or am I going to have to run maybe a cash poor type of strategy or am I going to be rich as thieves this game uh, and there's going to be extra bandits there, almost no hazards in the way. Um, the other thing that you, the final thing that you should consider with those things is that on a board like this one here, where there's a fair amount of hazards, taxers are more valuable. On a board with fewer hazards, taxers are less valuable. Um, taxers, by the way, I just mean those buildings that have the green and black hands that other players need to pay you with. So thing number two to consider on setup, and this is important-ish, is what the actual layout of the buildings are. So the way I've laid them out on the board right here right now is the, the default A, B, C, D, E, F, G setup, uh, which you probably don't use if you've played this game more than three times. 
uh, and and you do the random, which is much more fun. But part of the reason I chose this uh, initial setup to talk about is because it is one of the friendliest setups you can have, which is clearly why it's chosen. Why is that? So really, the, the three things you care about are the the payoff buildings, or you know the the the, the spending buildings, which is. This one right here, the hiring building is what I'll call it. Um, the building building is which what I'll call this one. And then the cows building, which is this one. And these three buildings are where you can spend your money to get things, right? Which will ultimately convert into victory points or additional actions or um, whatever. One of the nice things about Great Western Trail is everything that you are doing inherently makes points. When you buy cows, you're making your deck better, but also gives you points. When you're buying buildings, you put buildings on the board, but they also give you points. Um, even the people that don't give you points for the first couple will give you points when you get to the higher, you know, fifth and sixth of those, those, those fellas out there. Um, that very first building, the hiring building is the most significant building. Every single player at the table needs to use the hiring building. And the fact that this is at the very beginning of the trail means that folks are generally going to be at their richest right after delivering to Kansas City. So everyone is going to be able to buy the um, folks that they do want to buy. Not only that, but when you go into Kansas City and you are deciding what things to push out, you have a little bit more control over what's going to be available kind of at the beginning of the trail. So where this building is, is very, very, very important in terms of figuring out like, how am I going to be kind of collecting money or spending money? It being at the beginning of the trail just says you've got the money that you have essentially at the end of the lap, and then you can come in and buy stuff. Now, one thing I will warn about this building being right at the beginning of the trail that I think people forget is that it's really a lot more efficient to hire two people on a stop there than it is to hire one person to stop there. And what people will do is they'll get into a trap where they are just hiring one person repeatedly over and over again, um, stopping at the beginning of the trail there because essentially they've spent all their money by the time they get to the end of the trail. They get enough money in Kansas City to hire one person, but not enough to hire two. And then they come in, hire someone, winch, wash, repeat, until essentially they're in a situation where they've just stopped and purchased one person every time. It's not bad to, to hire one person if it's appropriate for your game plan, the person's doing a lot for you, but it is more efficient to hire two people. So just consider that if you are always stopping in that location at the beginning. The fact that both of these buildings are at the beginning, um, the, the building building and the hiring person building, means that folks are generally going to be able to execute the game plans that they want to do without you mucking up too much um, and getting too many taxers in the way before they can kind of execute the things that they want to do. The other thing to consider is where this building is right here, where the building building is right here, is kind of uh, what uh, a friend of mine referred to as sort of the, the dump spot. Everybody seems to wind up in that bottom corner. So considering what that building is in that bottom corner there um, and realizing that a lot of players are probably going to stop there throughout the course of the trail is an important thing to realize. The other thing to consider about this first spot right here is that this is the spot that is easiest to skip with move points. Um, essentially, unless the entire beginning of the trail uh, is is filled up, uh, the, the swamp is like totally filled up with buildings, you can either choose you know, that, that first neutral building or that second neutral building, and there's a chance that you put something in the middle there that could be your other choice of, of where to go at the beginning of the, the lap, essentially. Uh, so it can be a situation where you have to ask yourself, like this, this starting building of the trail, let's say that it is the cows building. Is this the kind of building that I want to be skipping every time? I certainly could be skipping it every time. The cows building being right at the beginning is good for cowboys because they have, you know, the money essentially to buy cows at the beginning, but it's also actually good for the other strategies because people can very easily skip over this if they're not planning on using their money for cows. However, if this cows building is in the bottom left corner right here, this is still good for cowboys because it's easy to drop into that corner. It's a little bit more awkward probably for the other strategies because they might not want to be spending their money on cows and there's a really good chance that they're going to end up kind of moving in that direction. The other thing to consider um, with these spender buildings is which of them not only go at the beginning of the trail, but which of them go at the top of the trail. So if you see that hiring and building is all the way at the top of the trail here, it's going to kind of change the calculus a little bit. Um, it means you're going to go all the way through the trail, and if there's taxers and hazards on the way, you might be a little bit more broke by the time it gets to the end. That being said, the way this current board is laid out, um, you could maybe get a bunch of money in the middle of the trail at this bandit station, at this discard two people station, 
Um, so you can maybe re-up, but if there's taxers kind of at the end, if, if people put them sort of in that, that top forest by the rockfall area there, it can get a little bit of a pain to do these two things. Also, there's a significant difference between the setup that I've proposed where the, the person building is here and the, oops, and the building building is here uh, and the other way around because people being at the very end of the trail means that you're not going to be able to use them essentially on the loop that you buy them, right? You're going to go deliver to Kansas after that and you're really thinking about what it is that you can set up for next turn. It requires you to actually kind of um, plan how much money you are intending on getting at Kansas to figure out like how you're going to sort of go through your next lap, which gets a little bit trickier. I think another thing to consider, you know, I mentioned sort of where the money comes from these guys. They, these neutral buildings, I think, can be in most places along the trail. You don't have to consider them too heavily. I'm more interested in considering what these two buildings are. The reason is if they cluster, especially, it can get really awkward. A setup at the beginning of the game like this means you're going to probably be moving that train engineer a fair amount of the time. And if you're not playing an engineer strategy, this ends up being a wasted action. So if you see this as a setup at the beginning, then you either really quickly want to lay down a building of your own that you're going to land on and that bottom swamp route there. Uh, that might even be more important than putting an appropriate taxer on the on the on, on the battlefield in play. Um, or if you yourself are going for an engineer strategy, you know that you're kind of going to be able to do that right off the bat every time you kind of start a lap. It's still also, frankly, a little bit awkward for engineers because they kind of have to do one stop, two stop, do their engineer thing. Um, and then it sort of depends on what the back half looks like in terms of like, are they going to have money still? How's the timing going? Because they're going to be going a lot slower than the other players. I think actually one of the more ideal engineer setups is one um, that's in this kind of, you know, this, this everybody stops here, spart something like this because you have spots kind of at the beginning, at the middle, and then you know, depending on what's up here, probably at the end that you can conveniently stop at on your way through the trail. Um, ultimately, what you're thinking about in the long term when you are building your buildings and when you're considering these neutral buildings is what am I doing at the beginning of the trail? What am I doing in the middle of the trail? Am I stuck in the middle of the trail for a long period of time that I need to have a second answer to that question? And what am I doing at the end of the trail? So, some maps don't get very cluttered. Those tend to be ones that have fewer hazards or hazard removers that take those away. Um, and that is a situation where folks uh, probably can just kind of do a boom, boom, boom. I'm going to do this. And you can play this entire game without building any of your own buildings and win. I mean, you don't you don't need your own building infrastructure to win this game. But the way that the board is set up is going to help dictate that. Like this, the way this board is set up right here is a little bit more advantageous for an engineer's player because they have things to do in the middle, at the beginning, and at the end. I don't know. I start with the middle, but that's where, that's where we're at. Um, another thing that can come up. I mean, I, can, I could do these permutations all day long. So we'll, we'll wrap this up is sort of if money is at the beginning of the trail like this, um, even if there are taxers in play, folks will have an opportunity to kind of like re up their cash rate at the beginning and allows people to kind of like make really big plays, especially if you've got your hiring, you know, guy right here or right here. Uh, that kind of stuff can be really impactful. So considering what those sort of initial buildings are, what that initial setup looks like is going to help dictate what the flow of the game is going to be. It doesn't necessarily mean that any given strategy is necessarily bad or necessarily good. I think that depends a lot more on the personal buildings, which is what we're going to talk about now. For the private buildings, we're going to look at buildings in pairs, and this is a pair of pairs right here. So uh, I don't generally refer to them as like 4A, 4B, which are the most important buildings in a four-player game, which is mostly what I'm going to be talking about. I'll, I'll mention other type of player counts, but even not in a four-player game, um, I think 4A and 4B are probably the most important thing to consider. Uh, it's the first thing I look at when I, I see a game flip. Why? Um, for 4A, 4B, and a four-player game, this is the big, heavy, expensive taxer. This is the, the most amount of money. Oh, I'm sorry. My little, my little P is uh, screaming. Um, the most important expensive taxer that there is that just about every player can get into play either very easily by just having picked up a uh, second builder or just from upgrading a one to a two, uh, which is maybe viable depending on what it is that you're you're doing with your setup. Um, 
4A and 4B are both powerful buildings just for this tax ability alone, but both of their effects are also deeply significant. Um, the ability to move your rancher for free essentially means that both of these read get a bonus action on your turn and then go do the other thing that I've attached this to. Where these buildings get placed changes the texture of the map in a way for you and for other players that is just extremely significant. Um, placing them with the idea of where opponents are going to ultimately place their other buildings is very, very important. Um, 4B in particular is one of the most powerful buildings you can have in a cowboy strategy. The other thing I'll add about 4B is that there's a pretty sweet location that you can use. If you can get 4B up here or up here and people don't clog up the top of the row, which often they don't, um, you can slingshot from this location, draw discard cows, and go straight into Kansas City, which is one of the just nicest little combos, basically a one building combo uh, in this game. Uh, three is a lot of extra move, gets you a lot of flexibility, and letting you cycle through your deck when you're playing a cowboy strategy is just so important because there's just a lot of junk in there that you want to get through and you want to get to the good cows um, and you want to be moving through that deck as quickly as possible, as often as possible. Okay, um, that's why 4B is important. It's probably the most significant thing to look at. That, that building can answer the question of, do I want to play Cowboys this game? And if you can make it work, uh, it's a really nice payoff for a Cowboy. 4A is also really important because this building in the game, assuming that people have some decent access to money, some decent access to flow, is going to be the second kind of uh, most important thing to, is this going to be a taxer heavy game or a hazard heavy game? Uh, at the beginning of the game, however many hazards are out there is the most important thing that's going to determine that. We've already kind of talked about that. But this will say... You know, at a certain point in the game, a bunch of those hazards are going to be gone. $5 for four points or $5 for three points is a great ratio, and you will use this to clear up your sections of the board. Um, this is a kind of building that is sort of odd in that it can cannibalize itself. The more hazards you remove, generally the less effective these taxers are. Uh, and that's not always the case. Sometimes people just don't have the money to use them, actually, in the Great Western Trail finals that we played last year um, for the World Series of Board Gaming. We had this building, and taxation was still a huge, huge problem because players did not have money to actually remove the hazards from the board, and there were just so, so many hazards that had come into play um, that we essentially ended up getting overwhelmed. But this having this building in play can sort of clear the board, clear the flow, and so getting it into play earlier so that you can get those, that tax money and then you can take advantage of clearing out the paths that you want to clear out um, can be really significant. This other set of buildings, 2A and 2B here, I've kind of flip-flopped where my A's and B's are, um, but that's intentional because 2A and 4B are the best of friends. If 2A and 4B are both in the game, you can play Cowboys. Cowboys is an extremely good, viable strategy. These are the two most significant buildings you are looking for if you're considering playing a Cowboy strategy in the game. If neither of these buildings in play, there's a really good chance you're going to lose with Cowboys. If one of these buildings is in play, you can absolutely win with Cowboys. Kind of depends on how the rest of the game goes. But I'm, I'm of the opinion that if neither 2A nor 4B are in the game and you're playing Cowboys, you are a very brave person. Um, Sometimes, again, tactically, you're going to kind of stumble into that. It sort of also depends on where the other um, cow market is, the, the, the neutral cow market. So you can get away with it, but I'm just, you know, warning you in advance. If neither of these buildings are in play, I don't think I want to be playing Cowboys that game. 2B is not that important. Um, it's it's a building that I've, I originally thought was really, really awful, and I've actually been impressed by seeing how, how folks have used it. It can be really fun, especially when you throw it on one of those hazard spaces, um, letting you kind of cycle through your hand or cycle out the really bad stuff in your hand and getting additional train movements early in the game so that you can get station masters in a way um, that you might not be able to otherwise, or you might have to spend a lot of money to do otherwise. And so um, building 2B is, has, has impressed me more and more over time. That being said, in the games that it exists, I'm going to end up playing it, I don't know, one out of five or six times. If you don't play it like really early in the game, it's just at most a stepping stone into upgrading into something else like 4A or 4B um, along the way. In fact, actually, I would say that's probably where 2B shines the most as you put it down at the beginning, you use it once or twice, and then you upgrade it into one of those 
four A or four B buildings there. Those those the the primary black hand taxers um, that I think are 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 more valuable if you don't have yourself a second builder. So uh, again, these are the buildings I'm looking for if I'm considering a cowboy strategy. It's four B two A and uh, what I call essentially the, the cowboy shuffler and the um, extra cow market. Now, one last thing I'll say about the cow market before moving on, if you're playing a cowboy strategy and you can get that cow market on a hazard location where you don't have to pay too many taxes to get to that hazard location, it really, really ups your strategy because cowboys tend to struggle to get certificates and putting this on a hazard location means you're going to cycle through your hand. You're going to get the certificates that you need uh, to make those deliveries and just kind of get get a little bit more flexibility on what that cow delivery strategy is going to look like. I lied briefly when I said we were going to look at them in pairs. I actually want to consider what am I going to be looking at if I'm playing an engineer this game. First of all, engineer strategy actually kind of prefers the building setup to be just sort of garbage. You want kind of the worst buildings to be available so that people aren't incentivized to build too many buildings because as an engineer, you have two neutral buildings in play that you are using that no one else is using. And so you're kind of already advantaged um, with that strategy if buildings are bad. Uh, that being said, these two buildings are the ones that I kind of consider most. Uh, I think when I'm seeing an engineer strategy, the first one is asking the question of, can I get out of the gate or can someone get out of the gate quickly with trains? That's sometimes good and sometimes bad for an engineer strategy. Sort of depends on um, what the competition is looking like. Do you want to get to that first station master? If you do, having that building in play is really annoying. It means that other players are probably going to be able to, to compete with you for it in a way that they normally wouldn't. However, if you're okay with it, this actually might be beneficial because you might be able to hop over another player or two if you're okay with losing that first station master. Um, this actually might end up giving you a couple extra moves along the way uh, as other players move themselves along the train track. And then this other building here, 6A, which is the like hiring and moving building. Um, hire move back in first edition was like my favorite building in the game. It used to cost only three builders. Um, now they made it a little bit more expensive, which makes a pretty significant difference in how easy it is to get this building into play. Um, but I'm still a pretty big fan of it. I think the nicest kind of path towards building this building is if you get yourself a second builder, you build a two level building, and then you build a two level building up into the four level building, and then you lose your builder off to a station master along the way. That being said, most of the level two buildings are pretty sweet. You want them to stay in play for a really long time. We just looked at the ones that were most significant. So it's a pretty it's a pretty steep price to pay um, compared to what it used to be, which was just hop a one up to a three or have three builders and kind of just build it straight out. So this building became a lot harder, um, but you can do sort of a little bit of a hybrid builder engineer strategy um, with this building. It is very nice. It's not significant. It's not um, required. It's not essential. How about that for uh, running a good engineer strategy? Engineers can just run without any buildings whatsoever. What about builder strategy? Builder strategy just likes buildings. Um, I'll go through them and kind of comment on which buildings are good and which buildings are bad. Builder wants lots of good buildings, uh, but there isn't any in particular that I'd look at and say, oh, this is a builder game. Um, for the most part, I don't think that it makes a huge, huge difference. There's one exception, I think, and that one's really more just like a frosting type of building, I think, than a crucial to the gameplay type building. So you'll notice that of the three kind of primary strategies, uh, that, that Cowboys cares the most about what the building setup looks like at the beginning of the game. Um, I said the three main strategies, which is just kind of focusing uh, on you know, either engineering, building, or buying cows. But I also think that it's important to recognize that there are other lots of good hybrid strategies in this game. And one of the kind of, I think, actually nicer low-key strategies is the um, hazard strategy. And so that building 4B that we were talking about before, nope, it's one of these. Um, well, I'll find it later. Um, that building 4B that we were talking about is the one that lets you remove hazards for a cheaper price. Um, that one can score you a lot of points in games just by focusing on removing hazards and kind of picking up other things along the way. Um, particularly maybe if you pick up a couple station master tiles and you're trying to figure out how you're going to score points for the rest of the game, that building can single-handedly answer your question. All right, let's go into each of the pairs of buildings now. 
As far as I'm concerned, both these buildings suck, except for the fact that they have a green hand on them. Don't get me wrong, having a green hand on something is amazing. Um, these are probably going to be buildings that if it's a tax-heavy game, if it's a hazarded game, might very well be the first building that you should play in the game uh, because they're going to start trickling you plus a dollar every time one of your opponents crosses it and them minus a dollar. In the ideal situation where you drop this off somewhere, every opponent loses a dollar and you gain a dollar. That's essentially you making plus two dollars on your opponents every single lap, uh, which is a pretty significant component of the game. So just having the green hand in the right location is great. Of these two buildings, 1A is better because if you're playing a building strategy or even if you just kind of dump a couple buildings, like two or three buildings um, in the forest, this can become a four or six money thing, which is not really what you want to be doing with a single action, but sometimes it's actually the best that you can do. And um, if the, the board has gotten, gotten clogged up, stopping on your own building to take four or six dollars rather than taking a neutral somewhere might just be the way to go. That building on the right totally sucks. Yes, you can make it work, but uh, don't try to. We already talked about these, so I won't go for them for too long. 2B is fine. Um, it's a little bit niche. It's fun to try out. I think it can work in some games. It's definitely like rushes a certain station master. You really care about what the first station master is for that building to be valuable. And then 2A is pretty amazing. If you're playing a hybrid cowboy strategy, a cowboy strategy, I really, really like 2A totally viable as a first building to put into play um, right at the beginning of the game. Some of the sweetest things that you can do with this, you know, suppose that this is a map where uh, the, I could build earlier in the route and then I can kind of drop this off here um, where there are no current, you know, there's no current uh, bandits on the way there. So I could drop in there, get myself that hazard action, discard the white cow, get a bunch of money, and then use that to buy early cows. This is completely viable for someone who is not playing a cowboy strategy but wants to pick up a few cows at the beginning of the game. These are some of the very few buildings that actually are different uh, in tier, one versus two. So three, this the three buildings, be it A or B, actually can kind of change the texture of the game. If it's on the side that's 3A, um, there's going to be three level one buildings, whereas if it's on the side that's three bay, three bay, three B, there's only going to be two level one buildings. So inherently, three A is better for non-builder strategies because it gives them another building to very quickly put in, very quickly and easily put into play. I like the building on the left. It's not backbreaking or anything. I think it's a completely reasonable building. It lets you kind of like cycle through things. If you're playing a cowboy strategy and there isn't the cowboy shuffler in play, this is a nice way to get rid of those two stupid jerseys that show up um, just kind of along the trail. Nice thing to put just right in front of a building you know you're going to land on every time. Uh, makes it easier to move on to that building because you've essentially moved your move spaces one closer, slowed your opponents down, maybe prevented them from putting a tax around the way. And then 3B building is a building that usually you're only going to build if you have two builders. I've occasionally upgraded a level one building into this as a level two building, but it's extremely rare. Usually it's because I'm just going straight to building this building. And then it's just a nice incidental bonus along the way. It's actually that both of these buildings are the same in that they are both nice little incidental bonuses, but the one on the right tends to favor someone who has picked up a second builder. I've already talked about these ad nauseum. I think this is the most important building in the game, no matter what side it is, just because it dictates the flow of the game. The taxation on it is the most important part. But on the right, it's a really crucial um, linchpin, I think, to the most powerful cowboy strategies that there can be in the game. And the building on the left gives you opportunities to score points, uh, No, really no matter what strategy it is that you're doing. Um, people get really sad. They'll say, I won't play Cowboys if the Shuffler isn't in the game. But actually, the building on the left is also really good for a Cowboys player because usually if you're playing Cowboys, you've got a little bit extra cash on hand because you've got all those sweet discounts. And so uh, you might actually end up using this building just to find another way to score points. Um, this is also a great building on the left for someone who's playing a station master, not really an engineering strategy, but someone who kind of burns out their workers and is just trying to find ways to score points before they get to the finish line. These are some of the rarest buildings that I ever see people use. That building on the left, 5A, I think is generally not very good. I say that, and of course, I use it in the uh, finals of this exact game, so everything is in context. 
Um, but the amount of times that you get to three buildings and have spare threes sitting around in your hand is pretty rare. Um, $7 is a nice little bonus, but oftentimes the three, if you're playing a builder or even a builder hybrid something strategy, the three that you have in your hand is essential for you to get that perfect 10 hand so you can deliver to Chicago, I think it's called. Um, that alone means that this building is one that you're not going to use all that often. The building on the right looks like a building that you really care about if you're playing engineers. And don't get me wrong, if you have a bunch of engineers and you have a way to get this building into play, that's awesome. It just doesn't quite do enough payoff for the structure that's there. And you might not even have the room as an engineer player to take two extra certificates. It's okay. I'm not saying that this building is bad and you shouldn't build it. I'm saying that the circumstances that require you to build it and have it so that it's good are niche. You need to have black cow in your hand, maybe ideally a second black cow in your hand so you're not worried about missing out on the one black cow that you've discarded. You need to have a handful of engineers to make the money side of it worthwhile. And you need to have had the builders to put this into play. It's just not that powerful of a building. Frankly, what the fives are is irrelevant to me in any given game. The sixes are also not that important to most players. 6A is a really fun building if you can get into play, but I already talked about earlier how it's hard to get into play if you are playing an engineer strategy. However, if you are playing a hybrid engineer builder strategy, this can be a lot of fun. You just hope that that's a game where you have a lot of cash on hand because it takes a lot of money to run that strategy. You're also hoping that the game is going to go a little bit longer, so hopefully other players are playing a building and or engineering strategy as well. The building on the right there, I think, is just a garbage building. Um, you can build it, uh, but I will say, and I build it a lot, but I would say 90% of the time that I build this building is because I am planning on overbuilding it to something else. So it is a step four building that is there to be overbuilt in the very, very near future. Um, there is an exception. The exception is essentially there are two builders playing the game and you manage to get this next to your opponent's mega building, which we'll get into later. Um, don't get me wrong. There are some situations you can make this work and yes, dropping it off next to the building building is good because you can get two building actions, but it really is going to be something that you'll use maybe one time and then kind of walk over it. It has its tactical uses, but it doesn't change what I'm going to think about at the beginning of the game. These buildings are the same building. This is the uh, builder strategy payoff building. It's just to throw an annoying gigantic taxer in the way of your opponents. When you have five builders, or maybe if you had four builders and you upgraded a one into a five, um, these buildings also sometimes get overbuilt themselves on the journey towards getting to the mega buildings, uh, but then kind of in the meanwhile are sitting there just taxing opponents for a turn or two before you wind up overbuilding them. Now, there is a mild difference in the two of them in that the building on the right is unplayable um, in terms of landing on it as a building. Build it for the tax reasons. Sure, by all means, go for it. But as landing on a building and using that as part of your strategy, okay, in the hundreds of games I've played, I've been like, wow, it does something, I don't know, twice? Um, it's just not worth trying to make this part of your plan. The building on the left, however, you incidentally might have just grabbed those guys and two certs and two dollars is a respectable action to take if you're in the middle of the trail and you got nothing else to do. The eight buildings are odd. I mean, again, I'm not really considering these at the beginning of the game in terms of my strategy at all, um, but both of these are about being a builder player and looking at these. That six building is a little bit nicer in terms of being able to um, upgrade into other things. And also when you get that sixth builder, um, this is a building that you can kind of slap down and play. This is the kind of building that you will use maybe once, but if you use it once and it's helpful, it can be beneficial. Plus, it's really more about the journey at this point because it's eight points and everything like that. The building on the left is sort of like a bad neutral building. Um, what I mean by that is that usually the neutral building that lets you take bandits is better than this one because a bandit in an auxiliary action um, is better than doing a bandit in a move two in most instances. Um, however, this does have a little green hand on it, which allows you to throw things in the way and tax your opponents. Frankly, what I most often use this building for and the building on the right is as a stepping stone to upgrade into the bigger buildings. Um, the building on the left is a way to build a five building that isn't the mega taxers that we just saw a second ago. But again, neither of these are going to impact my decisions at the beginning of the game. These are weird. Um, 
again, like with the previous one, these are really more about their stepping stone-ness than anything else. They are about building a building that scores a bunch of points um, if you have builders left over. But largely, I think these buildings are bad. The one on the left, I think, is almost entirely unplayable. There are some instances where you'll get to, to make it work, but I think 99% of the time, it's just a bad building, um, but it's 850 points. So it's there for builders to build, but it's really just a big rock as far as I'm concerned. The building on the right is a little bit more interesting, um, particularly if you have the big Wombo building, which we're going to get to in a moment, that has let you move your train a bunch of spaces. This can actually be a big payoff of victory points, as it essentially just allows you to move your train all the way back to the beginning and deliver to San Francisco if you've gone enough of the way. So that can be essentially go here and score or nine points, uh, which is obviously an extremely respectable play. So um, the building on the right can work out, but it usually requires essentially the, the specific building that we're going to get to in a second. Building 10 is the reason why you play builder strategy. These two buildings are absolutely game breaking on their own. If you can get one of these into play very early, like in the first third of the game, your odds of winning increase dramatically. Um, I think that building is the best strategy that you can go with in Great Western Trail. I think usually games can support two builders, and both builders are going to want to have to build these buildings in order to win the game. The building on the left is, I think, what more people tend to like as their favorite building. I like both of them. I find that the building on the left can be countered by opponents playing decent engineer strategies if people have picked up station masters and engineers kind of along the way while you were focusing on the building side of things then this card is really just four dollars and move four spaces and then you know maybe get some incidental stations along the way but you're probably not going to be getting station masters along the way and unless you're doing some kind of hybrid strategy or the game is going for a really long time you're probably not going to get to the stations that are really paying you off for doing this don't get me wrong, there are plenty of games where you can do a hybrid strategy where you do have the time and that stuff is great. And the building on the left is has the highest ceiling by a long shot because if you manage to get this building and then move your train in somewhere where you're getting a station master, then every time you land on this building, you move four more spaces to the next station master location and you can do some absolutely dirty stuff with this building. Kind of the most disgusting I think combo you can do with this building is you hire your fourth builder put that building into play you go to the building spot you upgrade that level four building to a level eight building probably the level four building you upgraded is that copier the one that I mentioned earlier that I was dunking on um, then you don't need that anymore you have this building now and then what happens is you go and you land you use your builder to station master and now you have one of two choices either you can keep rehiring builders so you can get that discounted build again or you can just stop hiring builders whatsoever and then go along bouncing getting station masters and sacrificing your builders along the way and you can just focus on doing a completely different strategy um, that that is one of the most powerful things about 10b is that it lets a builder pivot to a different strategy in a way that literally nothing else in this game allows i think really any player to do um its pivoting potential is really really high the upside of this building is absolutely bananas that being said i have found more success with building 10a because it's always solid um maximizing your certificates requires a little bit of infrastructure on your part you need to know that you are going to build this building because you are going to be removing discs from the right side of your board which is not very common when you play this game uh knowing that this is in play and knowing that you might build up to this is one of the most important decisions you can make even from the very beginning of the game if you go and watch the finals or if you've already watched the finals of the great western trail that i played last year the very first building that I play, the one building, I built that in the location that I built it because I figured I was going to build from one to five and five to nine. And that plus four number is a really, really big significant difference. And that building on the left costing eight and the building on the right costing nine is leagues different. You have to prepare for what that building on the right is going to look like. So I think both of these buildings are great, and any builder player is going to be happy to work towards either strategy. But even from the beginning of the game, if you think you might be going builders this game, considering where you put your one level buildings, because you might go from one to five and then five to nine, is a huge, huge, huge part of your strategy. These buildings are the builder 
like congratulations you've gotten to the end here's a brick of extra points buildings these buildings are the reason why i think builder is the best strategy that you can execute in second edition i think without these buildings builder would be a completely respectable strategy anyway and somehow people convinced alex vister that that wasn't true so he designed these buildings and thus the builder has arisen to the greatest of the strategies um it looks because it's worth 20 points like the building on the right is so much better than the building on the left but which you have to up build from to get to that building you're usually giving up enough points that the two of these end up being roughly equivalent frankly i don't really care which of these two is in the game as far as i'm concerned the one advantage is that the building on the right if you're able to build it before the very last turn of the game which is extremely rare when i'm the builder because i have other stuff that i'm trying to build along the way then you get to land on this spot and that's a really good action four dollars to remove two hazards um, can net you just a lot of victory points suddenly at the end so i will say that that building on the right is my preferred of the two buildings but the building on the left is pretty easy to build um, if you're going kind of like a low and slow builder strategy uh you can upgrade a one to a five right here and that's a nine point boost which is really really healthy or if you have five builders you can just kind of build this straight out which is really healthy the action on that building is absolutely useless though um, so you may as well just consider it to be a building that you've built for the 10 points last but last but not least are I think these were maybe expansion buildings or like promo buildings that ended up kind of getting tacked on at the end, which is why they go sort of out of order in terms of the, how difficult they are to build. They sort of exist at the end here. But that building on the right is the one that I alluded to all the way at the beginning that I said is, yeah, it's nicer to play builders this game. Again, I'll play builder just about any game, but if that building on the right is there, it's definitely a frosting bonus for those builder players. That being said, I um, have kind of switched between trying do I put this out and play first for the extra money or do I put kind of my payoff buildings or the structure to go up to my payoff buildings first? And I've generally found that going to the payoff buildings is more important than having this in play and getting some dollars from it. So this tends to be a lot more incidental than I had originally thought when I was kind of picking up the game. Don't get me wrong. It's very good. Uh, but you know, it's, it's for a dedicated builder who has the time to build extra things. That building on the left is pretty fun. Um, it's not common that I get to build it and make it work remember this building that i was kind of dunking on earlier uh that i was talking about was like kind of the engineer strategy building the building on the left here is a better version of this building uh and frankly i think it's a little sad to see them both in the same game the building on the left is a way that you can kind of get paid off for having your engineers having moved a bunch of places if you are doing a hybrid engineer builder strategy this can be a place that can get you six eight ten coins pretty easy um and that might be something that just gives you the money that you need to kind of run your strategy for the rest of the way. It's a little hard for a dedicated engineer to get a level three building in play. Um, that being said, you can make it happen. Getting a second builder is usually not that hard, and then you can sacrifice that person to the station master. So that's my favorite way to build this building is build a level one building, get a second builder, jump from level one to level three, and then uh, we sacrifice that person to station master, enjoy your job somewhere else. My friends, that's the basic idea. We've gotten dark enough that the uh, light is just making me turn into a complete uh, reflection here. So we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. But I hope this made you think of some buildings in a different way as you're starting the game. Things to consider uh, as you were kind of setting up and what strategies you're going to kind of want to execute in the game. Like I said, this game is as much tactical as a strategic. So none of them should really dictate anything from the beginning. But the ones that I really hammered on... Uh, the, the cowboy buildings and what the builder payoff building look like is the most important thing you can consider in any given game. And I hope that gives you a couple extra victories. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. It's been really fun watching those numbers grow. We just started uh, doing this, I don't know, a little bit less than a year ago, and we're up to 300 subscribers, which is hilarious for a channel that's just doing strategy stuff. So hope you enjoyed this video and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye.